Hi, this is JP from Not Allowed Over Arkham. In this video, I will be going through how you can play the Lord of the Ring trading card game. And uh, first, let's talk about this game a bit before we get started. Uh, Lord of the Ring TCG or trading card game was a game published by Decipher. Uh, it was active during 2001 all to the way to 2007. There also was an online version of the game that was active until 2010. So this game has been dead for a while now, but uh, because now there is actually, or there has been actually a on online platform where you can uh, play the game. Uh, I decided to dust off my collection, uh, do a tutorial and also film some uh, playthroughs of this game onto my channel if somebody is interested or wants to revisit this game or learn to play the game so that they can play online. I will provide the links to the uh, Lord of the Rings TCG Wikipedia where you can find the rule books and also a link to the online site that is called gembukku.com where you can play the online version of this game. You don't have to buy anything, you don't have to pay anything where you are playing there. You just have to register and you can build decks from all the available cards that were released for the game. Uh, keeping in mind, I only have cards until the 10th expansion, which was the Mount Doom expansion. After that, I think uh, the Cypher released at least uh, 8 more sets, if I remember correctly, but I could be mistaken. Uh, I stopped playing after the 10th release which was Mount Doom, and went off to um, university, so I didn't have time to uh, or, or the cash to play this game, so I had to drop it off, and well, I kept the cards, so now I can enjoy the cards, even as the game is basically dead. Uh, that being mentioned, you can still find some booster packs and starter decks on, for example, eBay. They aren't cheap, but you might find a a cheap collection somewhere if you're really lucky but I think that's enough of the uh, background of this game so uh, we will go through the basic rules and I will talk about the different phases of the game so let's get started before we go uh, more in-depth into the actual game mechanics. Let's first look at what kind of different cards we have in this game. So uh, the special thing in this game was that you were playing uh, both the good and the bad side uh, together in one deck. So you build a fellowship deck and then a shadow deck and uh, try to get to the end of the adventure path with your fellowship and at the same time you were trying to stop the enemy with your shadow cards or, or the, you tried to stop the other player from doing the same with your shadow side. So uh, right away uh, every deck has on the fellowship side a ring bearer. So Frodo was the ring bearer for the first eight sets, then in set number nine they introduced alternative ring bearers, uh, which were like Boromir, Galadriel, Gimli, uh, whatever, um, so you could try if an alternate reality, uh, for example Galadriel would have taken the ring and went off to try to dunk it into Mount Doom. So, uh, first uh, we have the ring bearer. Uh, the ring bearer also carries the one ring, and there were uh, multiple versions of the one ring. 
in the game. The ring bearer was carrying the one ring, then there were companions to go with the ring bearer because these companions follow the same template as the ring bearer. I'll go on over the stats on, for example, this Legolas card. So, a Legolas Greenleaf is a two cost companion. Uh, there is a subclass Elf, so if some card needs an Elf, you can count Legolas as being an Elf. Then there is a strength value. This is the strength you fight with. So basically if you are fighting a minion on the shadow side, you have to beat the minion strength. On a tie, the minion wins. Then there is uh, vitality or health, but uh, the game turn I think is vitality. So if you take damage, which is represented with these, uh, for example, these kinds of uh, tokens. You could use dice or whatever, but uh, these these kinds of tokens came with the game, so I'm still using these kind of tokens. So if you get three and it ex uh, equals or exceeds your vitality, uh, you are that companion is uh, removed into the dead pile. But for the sake of this <laughs> uh, card overview, let's not kill Legolas off. Legolas uh, has three vitality, then there is a signet. Some cards might uh, refer to spot uh, companions with the Frodo signet, so Legolas would count for that. There are different kinds of signets like Aragorn or Gandalf, and in later sets I think Theoden is also a signet that comes into play. Then there is uh, game text on Legolas. So just trying to keep it focused. So Legolas is an archer. Archer means you add to the archery total. We'll talk about that later. Then archery. Uh, there is an archery ability on Legolas, so we can exert uh, Legolas to wound a minion, and then Legolas won't add to the archery total. Uh, there are a bunch of different kinds of companions in the game and when you build your starting fellowship you can add companions up to four twilight cost so this cost here is referred to as the twilight cost so when you play uh, cards you pay the twilight cost so you add twilight tokens which count as resources for the shadow player when he wants to uh, when the shadow player wants to play cards, he uses these tokens. Uh, that is basically the companion card. We also have allies. Allies follow the same template, except they have the home site. So uh, the adventure pad is numbered from 1 to 9. This ally Elrond has a home site of 3. So, uh, when you are at Elrond's home site, Elrond can uh, join uh, skirmishes, which we will talk about later. Uh, not that much about that now. And uh, other than that, uh, the allies also have a strength and vitality. Then, of course, we have possessions we can play on. Uh, the either the allies or the companions. Just uh, search for a couple of these. So uh, we have uh, possessions and then we have artifacts. And artifacts are powerful possessions uh, and uh, usually you can only play artifacts on a specific character. So for example, Bilia here, you can only uh, play it on Elrond. Then we have, for example, a possession range weapon, and there is a here must be an elf text, so we can only play this on an elf, and that elf becomes an archer. So, uh, for example, Arwen is not an archer, but we play the elven bow on 
Arben, and now Arben is also an archer. Then we have a, a mount, and this you can play on any elf, but if you play it on Arben, you get the special uh, that uh, its twilight cost is minus two, so it's cheaper to play, and uh, then no matter which um, uh, which companion is or character is holding the asphalt? If you are at a plain site, uh, you get a plus two strength. So again, these uh, possessions cost twilight. So if you play one, you add twilight to the twilight pool. Then we have conditions, and for example. Let's look at Condor Bowman. So you play the condition and uh, it co goes into your support area, which is uh, underneath your fellowship usually or somewhere uh, distinct. And uh, then you can use the condition. It stays in play until you use it or some effect removes it. And uh, some actually, some conditions are that you can use them paying for a cost, for example, and uh, there are many types of conditions. Then uh, we have events, so for example double shot here, so you play this event and it says when you play it, so this is an archery event, so in an archery phase you can spot an elf archer companion to make the fellowship archer total plus one. So you play this, you can spot Legolas, which is an elf archer, and you can play this, so you get a plus one to your archery total. We'll talk about archery totals and stuff like that later. Let's next look at the shadow side. Uh, shadow side also has conditions, events, uh, then we have minions. And the minions follow the same template as the companions and allies, so they have a cost, uh, strength, vitality, and then there is a new uh, symbol here. So this is the roaming or the uh, site number of the minion, and this determines if you play this at a site number that is lower. So if I would play this at site 2, this minion would be roaming. Uh, roaming means that you have to pay two additional twilight costs, so uh, this costs six, so when it's roaming you pay eight. And after, if you're at uh, site three or after that, you don't have to pay the roaming cost. Some other cards might uh, trigger if the minion is roaming, and you have to then do what that effect says. Then uh, we have, of course, possessions. So we have uh, different kinds of possessions. So we have mounts and we have weapons, for example. There might be other kinds, but here's a couple of examples. Again, these cost twilight. So, for example, if you're paying, uh, playing one of these, you have to pay one twilight to play it and these don't have any roaming penalties so if you play this minion then you can play possessions on that minion and uh, they only cost the uh, cost indicated on the card and we of course had the conditions and events so for example this event lets you play Nazgul which is a culture uh, symbolized with that icon over there. Uh, you can play an school and its twilight cost is minus two. So if this was roaming, you play this card first, then play the Olair Atta, then it only costs uh, six, and so forth. The shadow side also has artifacts and uh, I think the only thing missing from the shadow side is the allies. So there are no allies on the shadow side. 
And that is basically what kind of cards you have in the deck, at least in this uh, uh, fellowship block. There uh, came later cards that might, might have different kinds of names for them, uh, but basically they are either possessions, conditions or events or minions. Uh, that's basically what kind of cards we have in the player decks. So you build the deck, for example, the, I think the minimum is 35 cards per side. Uh, usually you could play uh, bigger deck sizes and the uh, staple was like 40 and 40. And we are, of course, moving on the adventure path, so we have uh, sites number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. And if you get to no site 9 uh, and survive until the end of the turn, you win the game. But next, let's uh, look at the typical turn on how you play this game. So, for the sake of this how to play tutorial, uh, we will randomize that the, or don't randomize that we just decide that the uh, Elf and Frodo <laughs> Fellowship has uh, won the bid for starting the game, uh, 2 to 1. So how you determine the starting player is that both players will uh, secretly decide a bit of uh, corruption. You will uh, choose uh, from zero to whatever uh, count you want to take burdens on, Fro uh, on the ring bearer, in this case Frodo, and the one who uh, bids more can decide to go first or second. And even if you bid less, you have to place the burdens on your ring bearer. One thing I didn't mention is that the ring bearer has a resistance number. So, for example, Frodo has a resistance of 10. So, if you get 10 burdens on Frodo, Frodo becomes corrupted and you will lose the game. So, you have to be mindful of how much burden you have on your ring bearer. And some cards might uh, trigger depending on how much burdens you have. First, we after we have uh, determined which player goes first, uh, we will uh, decide the starting fellowship. And you don't have to decide this beforehand, but usually you should, because some deck strategies revolve around specific characters. Uh, for example, I have Haldir in this deck. I could, instead of Arwen, have Haldir in play at the start. and. Important is that you don't add any Twilight for from the starting fellowship into the uh, Twilight pool. Here we have the Hobbits fellowship, we have Frodo, which is always zero, and we have Sam, which is two, and we have Merry and Pippin, and they are both one. So it's a total of four, but there is uh, four uh, companions. And here we have three companions, because Legolas and Arver are both two. The maximum size of the Fellowship is nine, as in the movies and the book. But uh, the more you have uh, companions, the harder it is to advance the adventure path, and we will get to that later. So we'll draw our opening hand, and uh, the, as the Elven side has decided to go first, we'll start from them. So we get 8 cards, and we have uh, a bunch of Nazgul weapons and uh, an event, but then we have double shot, double shot, uh, a condition, a weapon, and Aragorn's bow. Then, because we are going first, uh, the players are represented with tokens on the adventure path, and the starting fellowship place their starting location where we start the game and the elves have uh, the prancing pony so the prancing pony 
as a fellowship action, add a burden to play Aragorn from your draw deck. And that is what we are gonna do, so that we can immediately get Aragorn's spawn into play. And uh, uh, there is a mulligan, so if I wouldn't be interested in keeping this hand, I could mulligan. So I would shuffle all of these back into the draw deck and draw six cards. But I would have to keep those six cards. After that, there is no more mulliganing op options then. But we decide to add the burden. So we add another burden to Frodo. Then we can search our draw deck for Aragorn and play Aragorn from our hand. Or we could not play Aragorn this turn. We just search for Aragorn and take it into hand. But uh, for sake of showing how the game works, I will play Aragorn. So we add a Twilight of War, and then we'll play Aragorn's bow. We add another uh, Twilight. Then uh, we pay uh, two for Gwem, uh, <laughs> Gwem Megil, which is the Arwen's special sword. So it gives plus two, and also it gives this uh, special keyword damage plus one. We'll get to that in a moment. And there is a skirmish action on the card also. So you just place this underneath the character. So you, if you are not familiar with the card, place it so that you can read uh, the card or just so that you see the name. And we'll add two more Twilight for the sword. And then we'll also play the Splendor of their banners underneath Arwen. It doesn't do anything yet because we don't have a uh, element bow on Arven, and we don't have any more cards to play in the fellowship phase. So in the fellowship phase, you can play companions, allies, possessions, uh, conditions, events that say fellowship in them. That you play them in the fellowship phase. So you have to be mindful of the cards you can play in the fellowship phase. And as a last thing you can do in the fellowship phase, when you don't have any more fellowship actions to uh, do, then you can move. And you will move to the opposing player's uh, side number two. This game was designed to be played as also one versus one, but also as a multiplayer game with, uh, I think, maybe even five players or six players. I can't remember what is the high count, but I think I never played it over three. But um, if you are playing this game as a three-player game, uh, there is a arrow on the side number. So, for example, the Prancing Pony says that the player on the left side of the Fellowship player is the first Shadow player, then the players play cards in order, so first the first shadow player play, uh, plays their location, then plays shadow things. If any twilight is left over, the next player can continue playing and so forth. But for the sake of this uh, demonstration, we are playing a two-player game, so there is only one shadow player and only one fellow player. So, uh, we play the Troll Shop Forest. Uh, Troll Sharp Forest is a uh, one twilight site, so right away we add one twilight for that to the twilight pool. It is a forest. Each time you play a possession or artifact on your companion, draw a card. So if we would have stopped here and played events, uh, I mean possessions or artifacts, we would draw cards. We put it uh, next to the Side number one, so we move to side number two, and because there are blue guys here, we use this blue token to represent the elf and Aragorn party. Then uh, we also count how many companions we have. 
we have four companions, so we add four more to the twilight pool. So we have a total of two, six, twelve twilight for the first uh, shadow phase. And at the start of the game, the uh, other player would have also drawn their cards. So I'll just quickly reshuffle this. And they draw eight cards. And they have the same option to mulligan. So, as you can see, if we wouldn't have drawn any way to um, play shadow cards, because we know we are going second, we might have uh, mulliganed. But as it is now, I think we are just playing these cards. And trying to make this uh, fellowship stop. So the game has a move limit, so it is uh, one more than the number of players. Uh, actually, it's in a two-player game it's um, two, so you can move twice. In a three-player game you can move three times and so forth, but uh, usually it's only two. So, uh, we start playing, so we have to pay for the minions we have, just place these cards here. And of course, I wouldn't know what cards there are in the shadow player's hand, so uh, the shadow player decides to play this Uruk Savage, which costs two, but it is uh, five sides, so it is roaming, so it costs four. So we remove four from the Twilight Pool, then uh, We'll play the Rook card, and it costs 4 plus 2 for being roaming. And that is all we have uh, Twilight to play, so there is uh, remains 2 Twilight in the Twilight pool. Now, uh, we have ended the Shadow phase because we don't have any more Shadow cards to play. We have this one event, but it is a skirmish event, so we hold that if we get to the skirmish phase, that might not happen because uh, we have are facing a ton of archers, but we'll see. Next we would have the maneuver phase, but uh, we don't have any maneuver actions to do at the moment. So we go to the archery phase. And the archery phase, we can perform archery actions or conduct archery fire. So the minions also might be archers, so they also shoot arrows to the, towards the fellowship. But these minions don't have archer. And uh, I think I'll demonstrate that Aragon is an archer, Legolas is an archer. So I'll just decide to exert Aragon twice. So I'm using Aragorn's archery event, exert Aragorn to wound a minion, Aragorn does not add to the fellowship archery total. So exerting is basically uh, adding wounds on the character, you can't exert the character to death. The moment the character is exhausted, meaning that they're, they have one vitality left, you can't exert them more or exhaust them or anything like that. You can only take wounds on them if they get wound, uh, wounded or some uh, wounds. So I'll exert Aragorn twice. And uh, now uh, Aragorn doesn't add to the Ar Fellowship Archery total, but I can exert Aragorn once, uh, wound this guy, then exert Aragorn uh, second time. In this spot, the Shadow player would have a chance to play an. Uh, archery event or something, but they don't have any, so I'll just exert it again. So we actually kill off this rook guard, and it goes into the discard. Then we have this rook savage left, and uh, I decide to play both of the double shots. So I'll play the double shot and spot an elf, and play the other double shot and spot an elf uh, archer and I'll add 
true to the archery total. So this goes into the discard. Now my archery total is three. So we accumulate the archery wounds. And now the shadow player has to uh, allocate these onto the minions that can take archery wounds. So at this moment, the Uruk Savage is the only archery minion uh, or the only shadow minion that can take wounds. So it is also shot down. And because we didn't have any minions in the assignment phase, which is next, we skip the assignment and then we also skip the skirmish and go to the regroup phase. So in the regroup phase, we could uh, play uh, regroup or perform regroup actions, uh, which we don't have. And uh, then the free player can decide to move again or stop here. If the free player free, uh, or the fellowship player decides to move again, the shadow player reconciles so they can discard one card. And at this moment, I would possibly discard this card and draw back to back up to eight and the fellowship doesn't draw any cards, but uh, we decide at this moment to take a backtrack because I want to also show the other phases. So we rewind a bit so we don't play these events and this guy actually is still alive and only took one damage from Legolas's archery. So we rewind back to the assignment phase. Now uh, we have to assign this Uruk Savage to a companion, and the fellowship player decides the order where uh, he can uh, the, he can um, assign these minions to companions. You can only assign one minion to a companion unless that companion has defender plus one plus two or whatever for plus one you can if it's a defender plus one you can take two minions at a time and at this moment we don't have any of those so we'll just uh, put this Uruk Savage on Arven so that is the assignment phase we also would perform any assignment actions this Uruk guard had an assignment action, exert this minion and spot a companion to prevent that opponent from assigning that companion to this minion. So, for example, we could have uh, chosen Arven, that you can put Arven into that combat and somebody else has to fight instead. But we are in the uh, past the assignment phase, we go to the skirmish phase. The, in the skirmish phase, we can uh, uh, do action. So the fellowship player decides uh, that there is no action needed because we are strength 8 against this strength 5. So we are winning and we also have damage plus 1 here. So damage plus 1 is Basically that you deal an additional damage to the losing side. Uh, we have this event in hand. It is uh, Skirmish make an Uruk high strength plus 2 or spot 5 companions to make an Uruk high strength plus 4 and Fierce until the regroup phase. So Fierce is another keyword that means that if the minion survives the initial skirmish phase, we have a fierce skirmish phase, so fierce minions fight a second time. But uh, we only have four uh, companions, so even if we play this, this minion is uh, strength 7, so still Arwen is strength 8 and winning, so there is no point in playing this card, so we just uh, decide that we are losing and this rook is defeated and takes two damage and we are basically in the same spot as before 
uh, this time we decide that we are looking pretty strong we have these double shots in hand and we'll push our luck and decide to move again so we pick the number three side from the shadow players deck place it here and move and we add twilight it is a zero so zero there and four companions so four so there is not a lot of twilight to play and this uh, shadow player actually decides to discard this and reconcile to eight and uh, we really don't have that much to play so we'll just play this to uh, empty the twilight pool so we got some uh, skirmish events which cost one and an orb captain but uh, as we said we don't have a lot of uh, result, uh, Twilight to play anything big so this Rook Ravager comes into play and uh, in the after the shadow phase we go to the maneuver phase there is no maneuver actions on either side we go to the archer phase and we spot two archers and end the archer phase adding two to the archery totals which have to be assigned to this minion which will die and uh, we skip the assignment, skirmish, and go to regroup. And again, the shadow player decides to discard one card and draw back up to eight. And uh, then also the free people player can uh, discard one card and reconcile to back to eight cards. So as you can see, the elf player did a really strong first turn, but there are no minions in the hand of the elf and Nazgul player. So of course the hobbit player doesn't know this, so basically, if the, uh, on the next turn these hobbits decide to move twice, there are no minions to play. Of course, I could play play tip down and discard, for example, well, one one event and reconcile, and still we don't hit any minions. So you could uh, get unlucky and not hit any minions. Of course, if you hit some minions, you get a uh, Nazgul. You could play a lot of cards on that Nazgul, like the which played for cheaper, play a sword, a mount, and this would be a really tough enemy to deal with for the hobbits without some hobbit trickery. But yeah, that is basically a turn of uh, Lord of the Rings uh, TCG. Both players take turns and uh, the one who gets to the end first is the winner or the one who gets the ring bearer corrupted is the loser or dead also is the loser. So if these guys die uh, then you lose the game also so if the ring bearer dies. These companions are expendable so you can uh, kill them off but you have to place them in the dead pile so if they are in the dead pile you can't play a second copy of that character but there are also uh, non-unique companions Just for example Lorien Elf there is uh, no dot like Aragorn has this dot here to signify it's uh, unique uh, the Lorien Elf doesn't have that uh, so you can play multiples of these and they can even die. One thing why you should could have more than one copy of a uh, companion in the deck is that, or an ally in the deck, is that uh, if you have another copy in your hand as a fellowship action, you can discard same number, uh, same name card and put it in the discard to heal one damage off in the fellowship phase. 
if we would have continued the game, uh, there are two sanctuary locations in the game. There is a sanctuary uh, location 3 and sanctuary location 6. So, just for demonstration, let's put some locations here. So, at site 3 and site 6, at the start of the fellowship phase, you can heal your fellowship for 5 damage, so you can remove 5 damage worth of wound tokens off of the fellowship. If some card says you can't heal that uh, specific character, then you can't heal it, of course. But uh, these locations are really important to keep your fellowship, uh, fellowship alive until the end of the game. But yeah, uh, that is basically the game. It's quite simple to learn, uh, really difficult to master as most of the training card games. You will uh, build your decks and have to be mindful that the deck has to have as many fellowship as uh, shadow cards in it. So usually you can also have some uh, combination in the fellowship and shadow cards. Uh, for example, some dwarf cards, discard cards from the uh, top of the um, enemy's deck or the shadow player's deck. So dwarf culture is known to discard cards from the other player. And then the Sauron orcs, for example, might corrupt your ring bearer if you run out of cards. There is no reshuffle, so you don't reshuffle your deck once it's out. If it's out, you continue playing if no effect will defeat you but you don't have any cards to play, so you're just uh, trying to <laughs> uh, struggle to the end. But yeah, um, I think that is mostly the game. There are a lot of keywords, and I'll put the link, of course, to the rulebook PDFs into the video description as the link to the uh, gamebooku.com website where you can play this game if you want to try it out. Uh, so, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask underneath in the comments section. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So, thanks for watching and until next time.